So I am what they call a video installation artist. What that means is that I make large-scale video artworks intended for galleries or museums. Just imagine them as though they are moving paintings or moving photographs. There isn't a narrative that's delivered over time. Rather, these are proposed, uh, often future spaces, uh, places which the viewer feels as though they can perhaps walk into. But my story begins in Guelph, Ontario, Canada, which is the little, well, actually, it's a city that I grew up in. It had a population of about 80,000 people, but it actually had a, a very small town feel. But uh, despite its population or, and the small town feel, um, it was also very progressive thanks to the University of Guelph uh, and the various research initi initiatives um, coming out of that university, that comprehensive university. Uh, it's known for agriculture and uh, environmental sciences, uh, the influence of which is very much felt throughout the region. When I was nine, uh, the Blue Box household, Blue Box recycling system, which you probably all know quite well, uh, rolled out in our neighboring city in Kitchener, uh, and then rolled out in the area, and then throughout Canada, and then throughout the world. So that's the kind of claim to fame. Uh, that was the... <laughs> Yay! Um, uh, as this was rolled out, so were the efforts to educate the public on the benefits of recycling. And it was the, um, the first time as a child that I had given any consideration to uh, our, effects on the, our, our, our effects on the environment, uh, waste, consumption, etc. Uh, that, along with other issues in the media at the time, the um, acid rain was eating our town monument. Uh, local problems, um, and the destruction of the rainforest, that kind of thing. The, um, uh, what we were doing to our planet began to play heavily on my imagination. Uh, it seemed actually that growing up in that particular time and place did produce substan substantial anxieties uh, in, um, in the people that grew up there uh, about the future that we were shaping for ourselves and the planet. In fact, many of the people that I grew up with went on to work th with the environment in some way uh, to make the world a better place, and it would have made perfect sense for me to do the same thing, but I also like to draw. So, you know, save the world, like to draw. <laughs> Tough choice. Um, I went and chose to study art, but for the first few years that I was finding my feet as an artist, this sort of niggle was in the back of my mind that, you know, did I choose, uh, did I choose correctly? Um, uh, you know, did art really matter in the, in the bigger picture? I believed in it, but, um, you know, by 2010, these works um, have uh, grown in size, so they're very immersive now. This is 48 feet by 9 feet, called the Air Edition. What you're looking at, effectively, is a uh, lunar-esque looking landscape with what appears to be a uh, holographic forest. Whatever, whomever cur uh, created this forest, uh, there's no sign that they still visit the site. The, the holograms are beginning to malfunction, so the, the whole of the image that, um, uh, changes over time. They restart themselves. Um, there's always multiple ways to read the work as well with this, and that's very important um, for the viewer, depending on your outlook. Um, this could be a site for uh, a forgotten site for pro proposed colonization, or it could be a monument to what was this is a detail just to give you scale. In 2011, I was invited to do a, a residency at a place called Art Pace in San Antonio, Texas. And the BP oil spill had just happened, which was a sort of uh, initial inspiration point. And I never deal with specific events head on. Uh, rather, I kind of work around uh, issues, specific, specific events rather. With this work, I wanted to do something with the idea of water contamination. And I found this amazing site between uh, Texas and Louisiana called Caddo Lake in a town called Uncertain Texas. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, it's the largest cypress forest in the world. Um, uh, but it also has the dubious claim to being the first through water oil exploration in human history in 1911. A hundred years on, the world is a very different place thanks to the countless disasters, but also widespread unchecked industry. Into the water, I inserted what looked like yellow, kind of snake-like ribbons of light, which undulate and pulse throughout the water. Uh, again, could be a couple of things. 
Um, it could be a, a toxic spill of some description, or it could be uh, some sort of life form, past, future, uh, that is uh, as of yet unknown. Um, as one critic noted about this work, Leviathan, its title, is meant to scare. While the foreboding in her piece arises partly from nature itself, the threat has changed course. We have seen the Leviathan, and he is us. At the same time as prem premiering this work, Fukushima began to unfold. It was just a few days before. With some nuclear experts claiming that it's anywhere from three to 85 times worse than Chernobyl. Uh, five years on, it's still leaking radiation into the Pacific. After that, I wanted to go to Mars, but uh, couldn't do that. So usually I start with an existing landscape and then I insert digitally whatever special effects to shift it into the kinds of landscapes that I'm trying to make. Uh, I could have gone to Arizona, but I found out that uh, NASA had the topographical data for Mars and had released that to the public, which then theoretically I could bring into a 3D <coughs> program to recreate the lay of the land faithfully. So this is what I attempted to do. Um, this is arguably the most sort of realistic uh, uh, experience of Mars on the planet, maybe. Uh, this is 43 feet by 9 feet. Uh, lay of the land is as faithful as possible. Texture, the rocks, etc., all had to be created uh, to be as photorealistic as possible. But that's just sort of a bit of a side story, a geeky side story. The real idea was that this is a future Mars, 100, 200 years into the future, and into it are the various remains from rusting remains from various missions to the planet. So we've got uh, Viking lander, Mariner 9, uh, the Russian Zond, which actually went missing, but some artistic liberty in this, uh, uh, Curiosity rover, etc. The The landscape, the, there's no sign that we ever colonized Mars on, on in my version. Um, and there's no sign really that we even have an interest still in Mars. Um, but the robots that are there are still, are still sort of partially functioning, still uh, attempting to do their jobs, which is ultimately to find signs of life whilst transmitting that data back to a planet where no one is listening. Uh, that search for life, this is, uh, yeah, that search for life, um, to know that we're not alone in the universe is really interesting on, on many levels, but it's particularly interesting for a species who is said to be responsible for the sixth mass extinction, which we are currently in the midst of. From that, we go to Orion Tide, which is finished in 2014. Uh, this could offer an explanation for Mariner 9, uh, slightly more positive, <laughs> perhaps, uh, explanation for Mar Mariner 9. This is a, a landscape, a, a desert from West Texas, and from it, there appears to be a constant sea or flood of rockets leaving uh, leaving the desert. And again, there are various ways that you can read this work. It could be space exploration on a grand scale. It could be war. Or it could be a forced mass exodus. This is Pillars of Dawn. This is a series that I'm currently working on. Uh, I've been working on for about a year. Uh, this is a series of prints which are being developed into videos now, <laughs> but they feature singular trees in vast landscapes uh, where the environmental conditions have uh, changed so drastically it's uh, entirely uh, covered the, the terrain in crystals. It closely resembles galena, or galena, I don't actually know how to say it properly, which is the natural uh, mineral form of lead sulfide. We have been mining this for thousands of years, poisoning ourselves in the process. It's just an installation image. Uh, last year, I had the pleasure of meeting with researchers who run the Imagination and Climate Futures Initiative at Arizona State University. Their, researches, their research focuses on how art can help to aid, or rather aid in the communication of the effects of global warming, uh, which is said to be the greatest human rights issue of our time. 30 years on, after the little tale I told you about the recycling, uh, the world is in substantially worse shape. Um, we've lost 50% of our wildlife over, over that duration, for instance. Um, 
Art and culture have the power to bring the, yet, the not yet existent into life, the future into the present. Can they bridge the gap between climate science and human choice? No, I sure hope so. Um, scientists and futurologists can theorize about our futures, uh, but artists have the ability to visualize it, allowing us to experience what life might be like, making our future in some way tangible. Given the state of things environmentally, uh, I would argue that there's never been a more important time to do that, to visualize our potential futures, to in some way make explicit what we stand to lose, given our current trajectory. Thank you.